Thank you, John. Uh, as John says, I'm Jonathan Enton. I'm the faculty advisor to the Law Review, and I want to welcome you here on behalf of the law school. Uh, I think it is worth noting that uh, John put in all the appropriate disclaimers about uh, my supposedly uh, making sure that the editor's uh, errors were not so serious. You notice he did not say anything about my errors, uh, and I will take full responsibility for those. Um, I do want to say that uh, I'm very much looking forward to this program because I think that it is fair to say that not only was, was Baker and that line of cases uh, among the most important decisions of the Warren Court, uh, in many ways, they are among the most important rulings that the Supreme Court has ever handed down for reasons that we will be hearing about today as we explore uh, what Baker did and what its uh, contemporary implications might be. I also want to say just a word about the law review itself. This, is, this symposium is part of what has become uh, a, an annual tradition with the law review. We've had uh, in recent years, a number of uh, quite remarkable programs here. Uh, we've had a, a very good program on judicial independence and judicial accountability. Uh, we've had a very uh, stimulating program about, uh, about uh, the implications of Brady against Maryland and, and the criminal procedure revolution. Uh, a symposium on corporations uh, and their communities. Uh, and last year we had a terrific program on government speech. Uh, I am confident that this program will be uh, a worthy addition uh, to that tradition. My job right now is to present our keynote speaker. Uh, Sam Sakharov is, as John noted, the Reese Professor of Constitutional Law at NYU. Uh, before going to NYU, uh, he taught uh, most immediately before that at Columbia Law School and before that at the University of Texas. Uh, he has been a visitor at leading law schools uh, around the world. He's also a prolific author. Uh, his bibliography uh, has something like 75 uh, articles on it and a number of books that are of particular relevance here. Uh, he is, and some of those books have gone into multiple editions. He is the author or, or co-author uh, uh, of uh, The Law of Democracy, uh, which is a leading uh, work on the legal regulation of the political process. He is the co-author of a leading civil procedure casebook and also uh, co-author of a book on the 2000 presidential election. Uh, I don't want to go on too much longer. After all, you didn't come here uh, to listen to, to me drone on. Let me uh, uh, hand things over to Professor Sakharov uh, to get this program kicked off. Thank you. Uh, is it OK if I move this? No? OK. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and John, thanks for the introduction, generous introduction. Um, it's, uh, I, I think that perhaps the best way to start is by trying to uh, reinforce for students here, particularly for the law review students, that the topic is indeed worthy of their, of their time and attention. There's a, uh, uh, an odd capacity to discount or telescope uh, events in the past when you were young. And so a decision that came down 50 years ago is something that happened shortly after the Civil War, which came right after the last Ice Age or something uh, in, in that sense. And so it's odd to, uh, to talk about events of 50 years ago without trying to bring them into the present and trying to see what their implications might be for today. Um, those of you living in Ohio know that uh, the state right now is going through its decennial wars over uh, redistricting. Uh, the state has lost a couple of uh, congressional districts as a result of population shifts. And uh, there is now a 
pretty open bloodletting among the uh, elected officials of the state to see who's going to get what and what kind of advantage can be wrested from the um, uh, decennial process. Um, this is uh, a spectacle that you should all enjoy because it is the one time where politics loses any pretense of higher purpose. It is the time when all of a sudden the ideals of our vision of government and everything else fall by the wayside. And what you see more or less is just naked self-interest. Uh, and you see self-interest that is allowed to uh, command the public's attention. It is allowed to reward those who hold power with the prospect of greater uh, capacity for future power. And this is an interesting spectacle because it is uh, the one time when politicians have to confront the only act of true perfection in human history and something that they don't like, lightly want to disrupt. And all politicians agree on one thing, that the one time that the human race has realized perfection, real beauty, was when they made the wonderful decision to elect them to office. <laughs> and it is a terrible, terrible thing to disrupt perfection when the human species uh, achieves it. In fact, it, it is so, such a, an act of perfection that there are times when we have to do wild things in American history, like disregard the, the words of the Constitution, so that after the 1920 census, uh, Congress, in its wisdom, realized that we had a problem in the United States. The population had shifted um, to uh, unworthy places like Cleveland, New York. Uh, we had immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe that all of a sudden were dominating the new swells of the population. And that if they reapportioned after 1920, as the Constitution said they must, then you would have a shift of political power from native-born uh, Americans, uh, heavily in the South, to the new uh, industrial centers of the country, the centers of immigration. And that would be something that the framers clearly would not have wanted. Uh, they didn't anticipate this uh, when they did something so stupid as to put the apportionment clause into the Constitution. And so Congress in 1920, in exercising its wisdom, simply decided we won't reapportion. Who's going to make us? And in fact, Congress did not reapportion for the 1920 cycle uh, until this became a sufficient source of public embarrassment that in 1929 they passed a statute that basically controls, uh, creates a default process that makes, ties their hand to force them to comply with the Constitution. Well, that did not occur at the state levels. At the state levels, there was also the realization that apportionment was disruptive, that it would put the wrong kind of people in office. And so in state after state across the United States, what you had was massive disruptions of representational opportunity. Now, it wasn't invidious in the way that uh, the exclusion of, uh, of black Americans from the franchise was. It wasn't done by uh, fiat to uh, discriminate against people as being second class, but rather it was the accretion of small decisions. And so in most of the states of the United States, reapportionment had basically stopped after about 1920. And so in Tennessee, which was the site of Baker versus Carr, um, the largest population uh, districts had about 1 24th the effective representation of the smaller ones. In Alabama, which was the site of the, um, of the companion case two years later, Reynolds versus Sims, it was over 40 to 1 disparity between largest and smallest. California, it was 100, over 100 to 1 largest to smallest. How did that happen? Well, California reasonably set up a system when it first uh, became a state that it would apportion on the basis of every county getting equal representation. There happens to be a county called Los Angeles County. Who knew it would be so big over time? Has no natural resources. Nobody would want to go there. There were no movies. Um, so uh, they just set it up that way and nobody ever changed it along the way. Now, Baker, I want to suggest, did 
five things. I'm going to talk about what it did in the first part of the talk uh, this morning, and then I'm going to speak a little bit more critically about how it did it. Now, in the first instance, what did it do, and why is that significant for today? Well, Baker comes against the backdrop of two critical cases um, before it. Uh, one is a case called Luther versus Borden, and the other is a case called Colgrove versus Green. Luther versus Borden is one of these fascinating nuggets in American constitutional history. It turns out that uh, if you study corporations, for example, you will learn the doctrine of ultra virus, that is, acts taken outside the jurisdictional framework or the power framework of the directors of a company, for example. Well, one of the great ultra virus acts in American history was the Constitutional Convention because the Constitutional Convention was a repudiation of the founding document of the United States, which was the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation said, uh, this is the form of governance. We form a pact among the states. You want to talk about originalism, that was originalism. And any change had to be unanimously approved. Well, there was a state that didn't like any change because it had achieved a wonderful form of governance, which continues to this day um, when many of its elected officials meet in the federal penitentiary. And that's the state of Rhode Island. And the state of Rhode Island decided simply that uh, it would not support any change, so it boycotted the convention in Philadelphia. It did not show up, which meant that the convention had no authority to create a new form of governance. Uh, as you may have heard, it did do so, nonetheless, and we now have uh, our modern constitutional era, except for one state that never approved it and never participated in it, and that was the state of Rhode Island. And so Rhode Island into the 19th century continued to have a, a form of state government organized by uh, the charter of the king. And so it rejected the democratic bases of the American Constitution and it operated under what it called the charter government. Well, in the 1830s, a civil war broke out in, uh, in Rhode Island between the supporters of the charter government and the people who considered themselves Republicans, that is, the people who wanted to be part of the United States. And there was a wonderful moment in which the leader, uh, one of the leaders of the opposition to the charter government had his home broken into by troops from the charter government who claimed that he was uh, amassing arms and engaged in insurrection and various things. And so he sued the governor in trespass. And so this is a wonderful moment because the man whose name, of course, history gives us these figures, but twice, the man's name was Martin Luther, um, claimed that, the gov that Governor Borden uh, had invaded his home and Governor Borden uh, rightly claimed in response, you can't sue me, I'm the governor. Right? So I have sovereign immunity. This is an act of state. And so it went up to the Supreme Court on the question whether or not uh, Borden was the governor. And the Supreme Court said, it's very hard to figure out how courts can handle that kind of issue. Because what if we were to hold the trial? There are bullets flying. There's no order in Rhode Island right now. And they were quite troubled about how the judicial process could deal with these first order political questions, as they came to be called. And the resolution in Luther versus Borden was, Borden was, an, was an extraordinarily intelligent one. The resolution was, um, we don't have to make that decision because there's other ways in which it will be made. And the other ways in which it will be made is there's a delegation from Rhode Island that claims to be the senators from Rhode Island. The Senate has to seat them. There is a member of Congress from Rhode Island claiming to be the congressman from Rhode Island. The House has to seat him. If the House and the Senate recognize these folks as legitimately elected representatives of the state of Rhode Island, then we don't have to intercede. And that kind of prudential judgment became the basis of what's called the political question doctrine. And I think it was a wise decision by the court at the time. Unfortunately, it, got, uh, it became calcified over time. And in 1946, the Supreme Court had to confront the malapportionment of, uh, of Illinois, the congressional districts of Illinois, so, very similar to the issue in Baker versus Carr. 
And the Supreme Court decided that the political question doctrine was no longer a prudential one, but was a jurisdictional one. And in so doing, uh, it, it adhered to the caution of uh, Justice Frankfurter, who wrote the opinion, that said that the court should not wander into this political thicket, that the, uh, the imagery of getting lost in the brambles, getting, getting pinned in there, never being able to escape, and losing the character of a court in uh, resolving this kind of case was something that, that should not be done. Baker versus Carr, in the first instance, and most notably, uh, broke down the barriers of the political question doctrine. And it did so uh, in uh, trying to achieve something that the Constitution seemingly had guaranteed, and that was that there would be an apportionment, uh, at least in the federal instance, there would be an apportionment that followed the contours of the population. The Constitution doesn't exactly say that it does, but if you put the census clause together with the, uh, with the apportionment clause, it makes sense that there has to be something approximating the equality of the population. Um, Baker did so, and uh, as a result of that, Baker brought the Supreme Court into American politics. So the first legacy is that we now have judicial review of what would once upon a time have been uh, political questions. Um, but I think that we do a disservice to the period if we focus in the first instance too much on doctrine and if we look at Baker as simply the court acting. Because the court's actions were dramatic, but the court's actions followed a political mobilization um, that led to Baker. How did it come about that somebody sued in Tennessee? Well, we all know what that means. You go down to the courthouse, you file a complaint, and then, you know, in the, in the wonderful world of law students, they don't exactly know how a complaint is filed. They don't exactly know what it looks like, but they do know that every case goes to the Supreme Court eventually because those are the ones they've read about. Um, and so therefore, Baker was simply the act of filing a complaint, waiting until it got to the Supreme Court, and then the Supreme Court would resolve it. Well, it turns out it was a more interesting political question because Baker v. Carr is a case that is born out of the complicated politics of Memphis, Tennessee. And Memphis, uh, both by features of geology and by features of culture, is the northern capital of the Mississippi Delta. It is the, uh, the center of Delta culture, and it has the cotton plantations, has the alluvial plains, it has the flooding of the Mississippi, the whole. Uh, pattern of that of the life of that part of Mississippi begins in Memphis, Tennessee. And Memphis is the part of Tennessee that is most heavily black, um, corresponding to the fact of its being of its proximity to uh, to the Delta. And there was the slow mobilization of black political power in Memphis after World War II and there began to be demands for greater representation for Memphis and also uh, for the other cities, for Na Knoxville uh, and Nashville. Um, and the realization that the malapportionment of the Tennessee state legislature meant that state resources went to the rural parts and not to the urban parts, and this had, uh, not surprisingly, a racial dynamic as well. Um, and so a group of politicians in Memphis began to agitate within the, uh, the city uh, to try to compel some kind of accommodation of the growing needs of the urban centers of the state. The calcified or, or reified or concretized or whatever you want to call them, the, the re, uh, reluctant and uh, frankly reactionary uh, sources of power in the state of course refused. And that was the mobilization that began as Baker, that led to Baker versus Carr. There is an interesting federal dynamic to Baker versus Carr because uh, when it got to the Supreme Court, the, uh, the plaintiffs in the case went to the White House asking for support. And they met with Archibald Cox, who was then the Solicitor General, and they sought to have the federal government come in on their side. Now this was an extraordinary moment because 1961, when this was being done, you had a new young president of the United States, John Kennedy, 
Uh, he was the first Catholic president of the United States, but he was also a president whose uh, hopes for uh, domestic legislation uh, uh, depended heavily on the Democrats who controlled Congress. But the Democrats who controlled Congress were largely the Dixiecrats. And uh, so there was a real problem if the federal government came in challenging the basis of the election of the Congress itself, because most of the Congress was elected from malapportioned districts. And so Baker was the first time that the Kennedy administration had to confront what to do about the realities of American politics, the ugly, uh, unprincipled coalition that was at the core of the Democratic Party at coming out of the Roosevelt uh, coalitions of World War II. Would it take on the Dixiecrats in any fashion? Would it take on the politics of racial exclusion? And to the credit of the, cre of the Kennedy administration, and largely through the persuasiveness of uh, Archibald Cox, the administration did come in on the side of the plaintiffs, even though it would have highly disruptive effects um, on domestic politics, and even though it would threaten the vitality of uh, the president's own base of support. Uh, I would argue that Baker is, becomes the ally of the 1965 Voting Rights Act in forcing open the American party system and setting the stage for political competition in the South. The two had the, uh, the joint features of disrupting the power bases of established Southern politics in the United States. Uh, the one, obviously, the Voting Rights Act, by permitting uh, the registration and uh, voting by African Americans for the first time uh, since Reconstruction, and Baker versus Carr by throwing open, or Reynolds versus Sims, the combination of the cases, by throwing open uh, the power bases of the established uh, uh, congressional districts and also of all the state districts. You have to realize that there has never been a Supreme Court case as wildly disruptive of American life as Baker versus Carr. I know we all read about Brown and the heroism of Brown. Brown had no practical effect for years and years and years. Baker versus Carr, within a couple of months of Baker coming down, there were lawsuits in 34 states against the form of election of the state legislature. Within three years, that is after Reynolds, virtually every state had found that either its upper house or its lower house, or in most instances both, were unconstitutional. Baker wrote out of office the state legislative powers of virtually every state in the country. Baker declared the elect, and its legacy declared the election of most of the congressional delegations in the United States to be unconstitutional. It was a massive strike against uh, against political, the established political power. And as we heard, Earl Warren thought that it was Baker and Reynolds in particular were not just among his most opinions. He thought Reynolds was the most important opinion he ever wrote. And he thought Reynolds would make Brown almost self-executing because Reynolds would put out of office the reaction to uh, the civil rights movement uh, that he was seeing around the country. So the second legacy is that uh, what had been the comfortable one-party uh, democratic uh, monopolies of the South were broken open. They were broken open by Baker, they were broken open by the Vot Voting Rights Act, and then we had political competition in the South for the first time in a very long time, and we started to have political competition in some of the cities in the North for the first time in a very long time. And that leads to the third uh, consequence for today, which is that the combination of court scrutiny and of political competition also result resulted in a realignment of political, uh, political parties in the United States. The political parties of today do not look like the political parties of the early 1960s. Uh, we have had, we have much greater polarization of the parties and we all talk about the polarization in Congress and the polarization indexes, 
Um, one of the reasons that we have greater polarization is that the parties are more coherent. The Democratic Party is no longer the party of the New Deal in the North and the party of Jim Crow in the South. And so you don't have the same kind of, uh, of mixed message coming from within, within the political parties. And I would argue that both of those are in large part a legacy of Baker combined with other features of American society, um, the Voting Rights Act. Uh, now, there are two other uh, legacies, and I think that these are both more internal to the court. Um, and and I, I just want to throw these out because it's hard to imagine a time uh, when it was not so, and that part of the uh, the, uh, the role of uh, leading off a conference that looks back at 50 years of constitutional legacy here is to understand how different our perceptions are. The first is, when we go around the world today, we find that there are more democracies in place than any time in human history. Maybe there were more five years ago, but basically the modern era, post-1989, post the fall of the Soviet Union, we have more democracies than any, at any time in, in human uh, history. Um, what's one of the salient features of these new democracies around the world is that they are all created with constitutional courts. And they are all created with courts that have tremendous power to superintend the democratic process. They all understand that democracies have an inherent problem, that they require the, the holders of political power to discipline themselves, to limit themselves, to accept the principles of a rotation in office, to accept the idea that today's control of the military should not guarantee tomorrow's, uh, tomorrow's power. And um, that turns out to be a difficult lesson. Uh, the United States is a model for countries around the world in this sense. Our election of 1800, a deeply contested election, was the first time in modern history that you had a, an elected head of state elected out of office, right? So that's, uh, that's a great achievement, and that is what new democracies all try to replicate. Um, our court, in the period between Luther versus Borden, and as that increased through the 20th century in cases like Pacific State Telegraph and Telephone, Pacific Telegraph and Telephone, or cases <laughs> like Colgrove versus Green, our court did not play this function. And Baker versus Carr is the announcement that the court was back, that the court was in a position, in effect, to play, uh, to be, be a, a watch guard over the integrity of the political process. And it did so by announcing that the Constitution could be read to require that there be certain uh, fundamental fairness in the political process and that the court would, uh, would be vigilant over that. The second is that sometimes you have to be careful what you wish for, because when the court comes in, the court comes in. And in many ways, uh, the legacy of Baker v. Carr is Bush versus Gore. Um, and there are those who, uh, upon the court's ruling in Bush versus Gore, uh, thought that somewhere, somehow, uh, Justice Frankfurter is really enjoying himself watching over this. Justice Frankfurter had, of course, dissented vehemently in all of the cases that unwound uh, the political question doctrine. I don't want to spend more time on that because I know Dan Takaji uh, has written extensively on the legacy of Bush v. Gore and will be speaking on that later. Um, so let me turn to, uh, uh, let me use that to set the stage for what, uh, uh, what uh, uh, Baker v. Carr did, and let me move in the last part of this to uh, some concerns about how it did it. And here I, I will be a little bit more critical of the court. Um, so uh, Baker had to confront the political question doctrine. And the political question doctrine, as it was uh, established in Luther, and then particularly in, in uh, Pacific Telephone and Telegraph, said that the, the court had no capacity to enforce certain structural provisions of the Constitution, most notably the Republican Guarantee Clause. And uh, so the court had to decide whether to take on these cases directly 
or whether to try to elide them in some fashion. And Justice Brennan, who was a courageous and uh, uh, a justice, one who was willing to uh, revisit fundamental assumptions of, of court doctrine, was also um, a pragmatic justice, and I say that both as a compliment and a criticism, and one who would strive primarily for the accommodation that would get him the votes necessary rather than try to lay down positions of principle that would later uh, mushroom or develop into uh, the kind of con a broader constitutional vision that he, that he uh, wanted realized. So in Baker, <coughs> Brennan had two paths available to him. One was the path of confrontation, say the political question doctrine, while not controlling on the, the controversy before him, uh, was not controlling for reasons of substance, that is, for reasons that went to the heart of the democratic process, and he could have uh, reinvigorated the Republican Guarantee Clause and said that a system of representation that has disparities of 20 to 1, 40 to 1, 100 to 1, was a failure of the Republican vision of equal citizenship. Um, or he could have done something else. And what uh, Justice Brennan did was to say that we could avoid the entire question by looking at the issue in Tennessee through the prism of an individual right to vote. And so what he said was that, and I quote, judicial standards under the Equal Protection Clause are well-developed and familiar and can be used to address this particular question. Now, this is a nice formulation because there were no standards under the Equal Protection Clause that were either well-developed and least of all familiar because the passage is bereft of any citation to anything that would look either well-developed or familiar. But what he wanted to guarantee uh, and this was the formulation that Chief Justice Warren uh, would come to two years later in Reynolds versus Sims, was that every citizen on an individual basis would have a full and effective right of participation. Individuals would have a full and effective right. And that became the immediate legacy of Baker versus Carr and Reynolds versus Sims, that all citizens in their individual capacity have this equal right and that the court's intervention was limited to the guarantee to individuals of this fundamental basic right. And that's as far as the court's interests would go. This ran into a lot of problems. Uh, a decade later, the court confronted, or two decades later, the court confronted a case out of, uh, out of New Jersey in which, for the first time, the court was looking smack at a partisan gerrymander. And weird districts, weird shapes, the whole bit that you're all uh, quite familiar with uh, um, and which is uh, going on today here and elsewhere around the country. And the court looked at it and said, this is wrong. What we have here is improper. And it said, well, we have to fit it into the Baker Reynolds uh, mold. And how do we do that? And the court said, well, there's a 0.07% deviation from the ideal between districts. Now, that's 0.07%. The census upon which this is based has a margin of error of about 2%, which means that we have no idea whether the districts that nominally have more, more uh, people than those that don't actually have more or less because the underlying uh, empirics are, are insufficient to get there. And so the court said, 0.07, that, sounds, that may not sound bad to you, but here's, here's a line that uh, I try to teach students not to use. It said, well, if you let them get away with 0.07 today, tomorrow it'll be 0.08, and then it'll be 0.09, and we know where this is going to lead. It's going to get to 100% at some point down the road uh, by this path. And so Brennan's decision there was that we're going to cut it off, the court's decision was that we're going to cut it off at 0.07, actually it's Brennan's, uh, 0.07 because any more, and we would be off to the races. Um, there's another opinion by Brennan from the same period, very famous, um, which used the same methodology. And this is a case called New York Times versus Sullivan. And this is one of the primary cases of uh, First Amendment jurisprudence. And New York Times versus Sullivan also had the interesting background 
of being a civil rights case coming up in different form. And this is what I, I try to uh, express to you that Baker, underlying all of it, was a concern about racial discrimination in the United States, a, a concern about exclusion, a concern about the overlay between Tennessee politics and the emergence of uh, a black political presence in Memphis. Um, so New York Times versus Sullivan is a case in which uh, there were uh, attacks on civil rights protesters and a group called the Committee to Defend Martin Luther King and Struggle for Freedom in the South took out an ad in the New York Times uh, which criticized uh, uh, various people in, in Alabama including uh, uh, a, uh, a local sheriff uh, named Sullivan uh, who was chief of the Montgomery police force and, uh, and so he sued him. He sued him for defamation in Alabama. There were 35 copies of the New York Times that were, could identify as having been sold in Alabama. And under First Amendment law, that's enough. We're off to the races in, in Alabama. And so the Supreme Court had to confront uh, a problem in American society, the problem of federalism, the problem of multiple jurisdictions. But what was really at stake was if you could not criticize something like the attack on the Selma protesters, the attack on the Montgomery uh, bus boycott, boycotters. If you could not criticize that, there was a fundamental defect in American politics. And so Brennan wanted to write an opinion for the court that would protect the ability to express outrage over civil rights, uh, uh, victimization of civil rights protesters. And he had two paths available to him. Uh, as he did in Baker versus Carr. One path was to talk about the importance of this particular kind of speech to the ultimate question of democratic self-governance. And there's a long tradition in the First Amendment about the centrality of speech, not because speech we glorify for its own sake, because we all know the Holmes uh, rejoinder that no one is free to shout, falsely shout fire in a crowded theater. There is not an absolute quality of speech. But there's a strong First Amendment tradition that rests the, the right to speech instrumentally in the need for informed self-governance by the populace. And there is, and certainly in uh, New York Times versus Sullivan, uh, Justice Brennan speaks about freedom of expression upon public questions and what he calls the profound national commitment to the principle that debate on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, and wide open, even including vehement, caustic, and sometimes unpleasantly sharp attacks on government and public officials. This is the instrumental view that the First Amendment is there to protect the integrity of democratic deliberation. The alternative was to simply put a, a, a categorical First Amendment right out there and say anybody who's a speaker has absolute First Amendment rights. It doesn't matter what the speech is about. It doesn't matter if it's directed toward the enrichment of democracy. Speech is speech uh, for its own sake. And I would suggest to you, and I don't have time to develop this very much, but I can certainly argue it further if you want. I would suggest to you that this is the same analytic move that Brennan made in Baker, that rather than trying to develop a substantive vision of democratic self-governance and of trying to tailor the constitutional doctrines to that, he chose a more expedient path toward a rights jurisprudence uh, in the First Amendment and the 14th Amendment. Now, there were alternatives available. For example, in Baker versus Carr, uh, Justice Clark said, why are we going down this path of the individual rights? Why don't we just have a sensible rule, which is if a state has an apportionment system that just makes no sense, it doesn't pass rational relation scrutiny, we should get involved. We should strike it down. None of this heightened threshold, tiers of scrutiny, all this. If it doesn't make sense, we should get involved unless, unless somebody else can do it for us. So if there's a referendum available, if there's uh, other forms of review, if the political process shows itself capable of repair, internal repair, then we don't have to get involved. But we're the last resort, but we're there if there is an irrationality to the form of political governance. Excuse me. And that was available as well in the First Amendment context. And the court uh, 
did not take it and instead created the actual malice standard <coughs> and absent the actual malice, which is extraordinarily difficult to, to prove, there is a categorical right of the, of the press to speak on anything they want in any form they want and not just the press but of any speaker uh, by extension. And I had to confront some of this a couple of years ago. I was asked to, to go down and, and give a lecture in Uruguay on uh, a decision, an odd decision by the Uruguayan Supreme Court. They had uh, decided that they were going to adopt New York Times versus Sullivan as the law of Uruguay and had done so in a case that should have given them pause. And the case was about a newspaper, quote, newspaper, that, was a, that had a very interesting business model. The business model was uh, they would dig up a lot of dirt on somebody and then go to them and say, you know, usually you do that in the Woodward type way and then you say, you want to talk to me or you want me to publish this, right? They had a simpler business model. We'll publish it unless you give us $50,000. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, they'll say, and for 100, <laughs> we'll run it on your opponent, right? On somebody you don't know, your business rival, something like that. And so this is, you know, it's a, it's a, it, it's, you know, it's a good business model. It works. Uh, it's, uh, there, we have variants of it in this country. Um, and uh, so they had run an article. This is the Uruguayan paper. They had run an article on the president of Paraguay. And they had done exactly this. They had gotten a lot of dirt on him on his personal life. And then they went to him and said, buy us off or we'll, we'll publish this. So he said, you know, I'm the president of Paraguay. I'm not going to buy you off. And uh, uh, so they ran it, and so he sued them in defamation. And the Uruguayan Supreme Court said, well, he's a public figure. He's the president of Paraguay. He's a big boy. He can take care of himself in the, in the court of public opinion. Therefore, categorical First Amendment protection. And it struck me that uh, they had misread New York Times versus Sullivan, or at least that they had read it in its easiest form and not in its more complicated form. They had taken the question of the individual rights out of the context of protecting the integrity of the democratic process and democratic deliberation to deal with something as significant as civil rights protests in in uh, the United States in the 1960s. So let me bring this up to the present, and this is how I will conclude, and it'll just take me a little bit of time, to give you three cases from last term in the Supreme Court in which I think that the complicated legacy of Baker, and particularly of Baker combined with New York Times versus Sullivan, produced results that I think, uh, well, I'll just say that I find uh, discomforting. Um, the first is a case called McComish versus Bennett. And McComish versus Bennett is a case involving um, public financing for office in Arizona. And Arizona had set up this system that several states are experimenting with now called clean money. And clean money says you raise a bunch of money in, in small increments and we will give you uh, state funding so you don't have to become beholden to big donors or things of that sort. Um, and uh, the, um, this is, a, a, I think, a, a salutary development. Um, I am skeptical that public funding will ever be generous enough in the United States that it will supplant the need for private money, but it's, it's a good system. Um, unfortunately, as with many reforms, it gets the enthusiasm of reformers, so they try to cram down private money as a result for other people. And so if you got public money and your opponent was spending privately, you kept getting bump ups dollar for dollar for everything that your opponent got. And so if you were an individual privately financed, even self-financed, and you were running against five other candidates and you got more campaign donations, every dollar you got would result in five dollars going to your opponents. And so it, this goes up to the Supreme Court. I happen not to be a fan of this aspect of it. I happen to think that reformers in the campaign finance area should just give up on the pipe dream of limiting the amount of money and focus instead on allowing more voices to be heard through things like clean money and allowing disclosure and an informed populace to make the decisions, but that's fine. Uh, th this is, you know, not a, not a terrible system. Um, 
and this goes to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court asked only one question, only one question. Is there any effect on any individual's ability to speak? Um, and writing for the five uh, justice majority, Chief Justice Roberts said that this scheme, quote, substantially burdens protected political speech without serving a compelling state interest and therefore violates the First Amendment. And that was the end of it. There was another question that could have been raised, and this was partially raised in Justice Kagan's dissent. And the question was whether the Arizona scheme increases the amount of speech and debate on a matter of public concern. Did it enrich the discourse? And one can disagree on how it should have come out. What I find striking in the Bennett case is that that question never entertained, never, was never entertained seriously by the court. Instead, what the court asked, is there any individual who will speak less as a result of this? And the answer has to be yes, has to be yes, because this is a pretty heavy-handed system that was in place in, in Arizona. And maybe this should have been struck down. On the other hand, the court asked nothing about the integrity of the functioning of the democratic process, and that was the end of the inquiry. So let me give you two other cases that now I'm getting a little further afield, a little bit more into uh, First Amendment doctrine pure, but, uh, but I thought I would, you know, since this is more recent than either the Civil War or the Ice Age, uh, it would perhaps be more relevant for today. So let me turn to a, another case that I find deeply problematic, Brown versus Entertainment Merchants Association, what's known as the Violent Video Games case. Violent video games. Uh, you can reenact Columbine. You can be the shooter in the depository and uh, watch the Kennedy motorcade go out in front. You can take part in, in rapes as they're ongoing. It's a wonderful world out there. And the, uh, you know, this is what uh, the consumers want. This is how people like to spend their Saturday afternoons. Uh, you know, there's nothing so much fun as, as shooting Kennedy as he goes by. Um, you can pretend to be all these southern legislators put out of office and finally get your revenge. Um, and this is stuff is, is, is repulsive. I mean, there's just no other way to, to think about it, but it's, I, I find it repulsive. All right, so I find it repulsive. Who cares what I find repulsive? California thought, okay, you want to sell this stuff, that's fine. You just can't sell it to children under 18. You can't sell it directly to children under 18. Their parents want to give it to them, that's fine. If their schools want to use it in the curriculum, that's fine. Um, but you just can't sell it to them if they're under 18. You can't sell them cigarettes. You can't sell them alcohol. You can't sell them movies with sex in it. And so what's the big deal? We're just regulating the sale. And the court says simply, and this, this time it's Justice Scalia, the California law imposes a restriction on the content of protected speech. Why is this speech protected? Why is it protected? It's protected because of the legacy of, of New York Times versus Sullivan. It's protected because of a whole series of First Amendment cases in which we simply ask the question, is it speech? Not is it speech that helps us in the governance of a democratic society, but is it speech? And at that point, the inquiry ends. And the odd thing in the, in the Brown case is that nobody's speech was being suppressed. There was no question the state was trying to remove certain kinds of images from the public arena. There was no question that it would be as available as before. Nobody was silenced in the act of speaking. It was only whether children could acquire this. And we have a long First Amendment tradition of the acceptance of silencing speech by children, right? We can censor what's in the school newspaper. We can have the state tell them what the curriculum is in public schools. We can search their lockers. That's not quite First Amendment, but we can do all these things to them. Uh, and unless they want to, uh, to, you know, to buy bongs for Jesus and smoke pot in a, in a public demonstration. For the most part, we can do anything we want to them, right? To the children. 
in terms of suppressing speech issues that we would never allow uh, to be directed toward adults. And so this is, this is speech, th th those are all circumstances where we suppress speech by children. So if we think about public discourse and the richness of the experience of the voters in running a democracy, we might actually have some interest in what the kids have to say about how, how the high school's being run. We might actually have some interest in, in their expression. But that we, we can prohibit easily under the First <coughs> Amendment. What we can't prohibit is speech directed at children by adults, even though the children of necessity are not going to be participants in the democratic process. They don't have the franchise. They won't have the franchise. And so in these circumstances, it seems to be a complete inversion of the purposes of the First Amendment. And we end up having the First Amendment invoked on behalf of merchants who are able to put out any garbage they want put it out into the public uh, arena, and we want to disable the ability of schools and parents to make informed judgments on, uh, on the education of minors in the name of the First Amendment. It's refreshing to read Justice Thomas's opinion in this case. He grounds it in a, in a deeply originalist vision of the Constitution, a limited originalist vision of the Constitution I don't share. But the central intuition that he has, and he repeats it over and over, is this is not a rights inquiry. This is an inquiry about how we structure the raising of children. And that has been a matter that has always been tolerated under our First Amendment traditions. And so I find the outcome in that case, the formalism of the rights inquiry, deeply troubling. Another case, and the final one that I will talk about, is uh, is the Snyder case, Snyder versus Phelps, uh, uh, which is uh, the funeral picketing case. This is an outfit called the Westboro Baptist Church. And the Westboro Baptist Church uh, likes to show up at places where they think they can get a lot of attention. So of late they have been uh, showing up at, they've, they've picketed more than 600 funerals, funerals of people unrelated to them in any way, uh, over the last 20 years, um, they like to picket funerals of the military. They like to picket funerals of uh, police officers who've been killed. They like to picket any funeral where there will be public attention. And so they show up at the funeral of, uh, of Lance Corporal Matthew Snyder of the U.S. Marines, a, 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 a uh, soldier who was killed in Iraq. And they show up with signs that say, thank God for dead soldiers, you're going to hell, America is doomed, God hates the USA, God hates fags, uh, so on and so forth. Now, they don't show up at the funeral, they're a little bit away, they're on public space and all that sort of stuff. But, uh, but there is a law uh, in <coughs> Maryland that says you gotta stay away from funerals. Funerals are the moment of privacy for the family. And if you need a place to pick it, you can do it at some place that the state will designate, but you can't try to chant and in any way affect funerals, leaving aside the fact that they started putting up on their website uh, the email addresses of, of, uh, of, Snyder, of Phelps's family and leave aside that they were uh, sending him blast emails that were to the family that were hateful. Leave all that aside. That, that, that's secondary stuff. I want to talk about the, the picketing at the funeral. And so the court says, well, you know, this is speech, and it's speech, it is speech, and it's on a matter of public concern. How did it become a matter of public concern? Because they showed up there and made it into a matter of public concern. Now, the, the, uh, the, the court had handled this once before. Ooh, I'm running over. Let me just wrap up quickly. The court had handled this once before in a case called Time versus Hill, where a... Uh, uh, an interesting case, the only case argued in the Supreme Court by, uh, by a president of the United States. Richard Nixon argued this, uh, argued this case for the family. It's a family held hostage in Connecticut by some thugs. And uh, the Time Magazine got some, uh, some pictures and some uh, uh, story on their, their ordeal and wanted to publish it. And they wanted to sue to stop this or for damages for emotional distress. And Time Magazine said, this is a matter of public concern. Why is it a matter of public concern? because Time Magazine published it, and so now everybody knew about it. 
right? So there's a self-executing quality to this. And the court in Time versus Hill never resolved this question. And so now it stays open to, to, uh, uh, to the Snyder case. And, uh, and the court gets lost in this same question. This is not a matter that is intended to enrich public debate on democratic self-governance. This is just an abusive uh, attack on individuals. It is intended to inflame, it is intended to uh, inflict emotional harm. It is knowingly going to do that. And what does the court say? The court says, well, too bad. First Amendment establishes rights. And here again, I find uh, my sympathy entirely to be with the opinion of Justice Alito. And it's, Justice Alito has a hard time getting at this doctrinally. It is a tough question. But his intuition is, this is not what the speech clause is about. His intuition is, this is uh, a targeted assault. And a targeted assault that takes place with words is no less a targeted assault. The actual malice standard is not dropped just because you put these people into the public profile, you put them in, you raise their, uh, the awareness of the, of the suffering of the Phelps family into su in such a way um, that uh, disables uh, the common law from responding to what is a targeted assault. And I have to say, I find this to be uh, a very powerful opinion and one that is doctrinally difficult under the First Amendment, but I, when I re first read this case, I thought to myself, thankfully, there is at least one person on the court who resonates with common sense. Th this is wrong. It's just wrong. This guy died for his country, and he can't be buried in peace. We can't offer him that. On what basis? On the basis that we have this legacy of cases that says, once you invoke the rights question, it's all over. We disable everything thereafter. All right, I have run over my time. I will uh, stop at that. I was told to leave some time for questions, and I'll gladly answer anything uh, you want to put forward. Now, because this program is being recorded and webcast, if you have questions, and of course, Professor Sakharov hasn't said anything that could possibly generate any questions, but if you do have questions, could you please uh, come down to one of the mics so that we can get them recorded? A shy audience. Well, professors are supposed to know more than Supreme Courts, etc., and certainly are expected to uh, predict what courts will do. What would the present court do with Baker? Um, I think that the present court is so acculturated to a world post Baker that the question wouldn't make a lot, it wouldn't cause them any pause at all. Um, I think that, um, let me give you a couple of, uh, uh, of examples. Um, until about the 1980s, the number of federal statutes that had ever been declared unconstitutional in American history, less than 10. There's, there's dispute on this because there's some Indian treaties, you know, there's some weird outliers, but basically it just didn't happen. Now we get several a year. And uh, um, the court believes that it has a much more important institutional role in overseeing Congress. Um, it was interesting uh, in Bush versus Gore, for example, that seven members of the court thought that the Equal Protection Clause was, or some variant of an equal protection argument, was a sufficient basis for deciding the presidential election and deciding how the recount should go forward. Two justices thought that this was a job which was trusted to the state courts. No member of the court thought that the judicial power 
either at the state or federal level, did not run to the question of the election of the, of the President of the United States. Um, I don't think that the court would have any trouble with the adjudication of, of Baker versus Carr today. Um, I think that the trouble the court has, uh, as for example in the partisan gerrymandering cases, is a concern about whether there are, let's just use their, the language of the court, justiciable standards that can be uh, developed. And one of the interesting things about Baker versus Carr is that it is a case that is written backwards. It's a case that says, okay, the, the objection here is the political question doctrine. Let me give you, let me run you through. Here's one reason it doesn't apply. Here's another reason it doesn't apply. Here's another reason it doesn't apply. Here's another reason it doesn't apply. And then at the end of it, Brennan says, well, now that we've resolved that, we have these familiar ways of handling it. Baker left open what was to be done. Had Reynolds versus Sims and one person, one vote not come along two years later, Baker would have been an embarrassment in American jurisprudence because it would have put out a form of judicial intervention and 34 cases were underway in the states immediately thereafter, it would have had no operational component to it. What happens with Reynolds is it becomes easy to administer a very mechanical one person, one vote rule. I've been critical of it elsewhere, but it basically worked. I think so long as one person, one vote is out there as a mechanical tool to be applied, the current court would have no problem with Baker versus Carr at all. I think that this is entirely consistent with the court's conception of its role. What would you say about uh, Baker, being, Baker versus Carr being sort of the first of what has become sort of a, a tradition of plurality decisions and, and a, if you will, an abdication on the part of the court of thinking it has some obligation or greater obligation to come up with a coherent majority more frequently. And isn't Baker really the first really significant plurality case in terms of affecting the political process and the power of the court? That's an interesting question. I have not thought about it in terms of whether it's the first. I'm, I'm you know, doing the memory scan right now to see if I can come up with an earlier one. But I'll accept, I'll accept that it might be the first. It may not be the first. I mean, yeah, but it's a certain a, a big one. Um, I actually have a uh, a dissident view on the question of uh, of the court uh, and how it should resolve questions, uh, contested questions. I think that any time the Supreme Court gets a case and it rules nine zero, either it shouldn't have taken the case or it didn't think deeply about it, um, and um, unless it's from the Ninth Circuit in which case it's a, it's, a, it's a different standard. But um, uh, I think that if the legal system is working well, and there's sometimes where it has to be 9-0, Brown versus Board, for example, where the court is really announcing an entirely new era, and it's not clear that the authority of the court can, can reach that far. But I think that the cases that get to the Supreme Court should be the ones where reasonable people can differ. And I think that the, that the certiorari pattern that has emerged over the last 30, 40 years, that basically uh, nothing gets to the court unless there's a circuit split, means, or very little gets to the court unless there's a circuit split, means that we have an institutional form of, of guaranteeing that reasonable minds can differ on this. And when you get to that point of distillation, if the court is going to engage really hard questions on which reasonable minds can differ, the court should split. Um, it'd be nice if the splits were not always predictable, and in some of the more, more, most deeply contested areas of American law right now, for example, the preemption debates, the lines are not predictable, and I kind of like that because it's hard to figure out how it's going to break. But there are some questions that are at the margin of where law breaks down and where policy starts to come in, and you, the court should reflect the political process in some sense. So you have a distilled, latent political influence based upon the president that appointed that justice, based upon the Congress that approved that justice. And so I don't find the 5-4 cases disturbing. I don't find um, 
uh, the lack of unanimity disturbing, but you raise a different question, which is what happens when the lack of unanimity in the split becomes incoherent? Uh, and so, for example, I was horrified by a case last term in a completely different area of law, a case called Jay McIntyre, which took personal jurisdiction, which is the threshold issue in every piece of civil litigation, and rendered it completely unintelligible. And the reason that that's a big problem there is that we have now imposed billions of dollars of costs on private parties who now have to litigate personal jurisdiction under uncertain standards for years now uh, for, in, for, the future, for the foreseeable future. And that's an institutional failing, I think. But on a hard question uh, like Baker, I would have preferred uh, the Clark uh, opinion to have held. I, I think that that was an easier standard. I think it reflected more realistically what was at stake. I think that it would have allowed a jurisprudence of accommodation to a more and more responsive political system. Um, and that under Clark, uh, the, the, the Arizona statute might well have been upheld, uh, for example. But the fracture in the court on hard questions, I, I, don't, uh, I really don't find that troubling. Another question from this side of the room. Um, when you were talking about the violent video game case, the issue in that, as I understand, is that the actual product was speech as well, in addition to the selling of it. Um, how do you see? The progeny of that case now dealing with the restrictions on advertising of tobacco to minors is do you think there would be a difference because the product in and of itself isn't actually a form of speech that they're actually selling a physical product or would that matter at all it's that's a great question it's hard to see in the opinion where that would actually matter, because the speech is the, uh, the directing the information toward children as consumers. Um, you are right that Brown had the additional level that the product itself was a form of speech. Uh, it, it pains me to even say that, but it's uh, apparently a form of speech. Um, uh, but I, I think that it, it calls into question all the regulations uh, that, that are paternalistic in dealing with children. And the court was obviously troubled by this. So one of the areas of debate, um, and, and Justice Scalia uh, invited this uh, distinction in his opinion, where he said, show us that this is a traditional form of regulation directed at children, and maybe we will tolerate it. And so one could argue that tobacco is more in keeping with a traditional health rationale for the use of the police power, going back to the pre-Lochner days of uh, the use of, uh, of giving the state greater latitude in the exercise of public health-oriented police powers. Um, so maybe there's, maybe there's some distinction there. Um, it's a funny kind of argument to make when you're dealing with what's obviously a brand new technology. So yes, it's true. The framers did not ban violent video games. Uh, you know, they, uh, they never got around to it somehow. Um, but, um, uh, but perhaps that's the saving grace on the tobacco advertising questions. But I would imagine that Brown will have renewed, give renewed life to uh, tobacco advertising which has the additional problem of being restricted by the settlement with the attorneys general. So it's not clear tobacco will be the, the vehicle, but maybe alcohol will be the vehicle, maybe other, uh, other types of, uh, you, know, the, you know, you can imagine the, the Bud Light Elementary School, you know, or something like that uh, <laughs> coming next, but I don't know. Um, since this is the opening session, I think that we have some obligation to try to stay reasonably close to time, and we are a couple minutes over, so let me thank Professor Sakharov for a very <laughs> stimulating speech. <laughs> and we will take a short break and reconvene at 10.15, which is about 11 minutes from now.